If you would, please turn with me in your Bibles to Acts chapter 23. Acts chapter 23, it's page 877 in the church Bibles. Acts chapter 23. At this point, Paul has been arrested. Uh, the Jewish mob is still calling out for his blood. The Roman plan of flogging Paul to get to the truth of the matter has been thwarted by Paul's Roman citizenship. And today, the tribune, the Roman leader, is bringing Paul before the Sanhedrin, the Jewish high council, to again try to gain some clarity regarding the problem. What is going on? But even the rulers of the Jews can't bring themselves to dispassionately consider the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. The words and the work of Jesus Christ do not bring peace to the earth. They bring a sword, as he himself said in Matthew 10, 34. The natural world hates Jesus, and it hates those who are united to him. The gospel of Jesus Christ angers many, and it stirs up strife, and it stirs up quarrel and conflict and hurt feelings. But still, we must proclaim the gospel because it is the only hope of eternal life. It's the hope of the resurrection of the dead. Before we read our text, will you please pray with me? Lord, we, we pray to you every day. But weekdays, in so many ways, are worldly days. Our earthly concerns so often distract us from your heavenly voice. So Lord, we, we bless you and we thank you for this day, for Sunday. It's a day set apart for the sake of our souls when we can wait upon you and be refreshed. We thank you for the means of grace by which we draw near to you and you draw near to us. We rejoice in another Lord's Day when we can bring our minds away from the cares of the world and look to you without distraction. Lord, let our rest be devoted to you. Let our conversations be uplifting. Let our reading be godly. And let our hearing be profitable to us. May our souls be enlivened and uplifted. We are in the house of prayer. We ask that you would pour upon us the spirit of grace and supplication. We're in the house of praise. We ask you to awaken in us every grateful and cheerful emotion. We're in the house of instruction. We ask that you, through your spirit, would bear testimony to the word preached. That you would glorify it in the hearts of all who hear. May your word enlighten the ignorant, awaken the careless, reclaim the wandering, establish the weak, comfort the feeble, make ready a people for your own possession. Lord, we ask that you be gracious to your people in every place. Lord, we pray especially for our brother John Michael LaRue pastoring a church in Dayton, Ohio, in a community has been devastated by sin and violence even last night. Lord, we pray for your church in El Paso. We ask that your word would resound powerfully in that place, bringing hope and healing. Lord, we know that one day all violence will cease. And it will not be a result of human laws or human education. It will be the day when your Son returns in glory and fully establishes his kingdom 
in the new Jerusalem when every knee bows and every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord. When your people are set free from sinning, that they might fully behold your lovely face. And when all your enemies are cast into the lake of fire forever. Lord, haste the day. And as we wait, Lord, we ask that you would prepare us for that day. That we would be obedient to your will and conform to the image of of your Son. We ask all these things in His name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. We'll actually begin reading in verse 30 of Acts 22. But on the next day, Desiring to know the real reason why he was being accused by the Jews, he, the tribune, unbound him, Paul, and commanded the chief priests and all the council to meet. And he brought Paul down and set him before them. And looking intently at the council, Paul said, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? And you, contrary to the law, yet order me to be struck? Those who stood by said, Would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest. For it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Now when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the others Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. Then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisee party stood up and contended sharply, We find nothing wrong in this man. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? And when the dissension became violent, the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away from them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. When it was day, the Jews made a plot and bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 who made this conspiracy. They went to the chief priests and elders and said, We have strictly bound ourselves by an oath to taste no food until we kill Paul. Now therefore you, along with the council, give notice to the tribune to bring him down to you, as though you were going to determine his case more exactly. And we are ready to kill him before he comes near. Now the son of Paul's sister heard of their ambush. So he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the tribune, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the tribune and said, Paul the prisoner called me and asked me to bring this young man to you, as he has something to say to you. The tribune took him by the hand, and going aside, asked him privately, What is it that you have to tell me? And he said, The Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow, as though they were going to inquire somewhat more closely about him. But do not be persuaded by them, for more than forty of their men are lying in ambush for him, who have bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they have killed him. And now they are ready, waiting for your consent." So the tribune dismissed the young man, 
charging him, Tell no one that you have informed me of these things. Then he called two of the centurions and said, Get ready two hundred soldiers with seventy horsemen and two hundred spearmen to go as far as Caesarea at the third hour of the night. Also provide mounts for Paul to ride and bring him safely to Felix, the governor. And he wrote a letter to this effect. Claudius Lysias, to his excellency, the governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them when I came upon them with the soldiers and rescued him having learned that he was a Roman citizen. And desiring to know the charge for which they were accusing him, I brought him down to their council. I found that he was being accused about questions of their law, but charged with nothing deserving death or imprisonment. And when it was disclosed to me that there would be a plot against the man, I sent him to you at once, ordering his accusers also to state before you what they had against him. So the soldiers, according to their instructions, took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. And on the next day they returned to the barracks, letting the horsemen go on with him. When they had come to Caesarea and delivered the letter to the governor, they presented Paul also before him. On reading the letter, he asked what province he was from. And when he learned that he was from Cilicia, he said, I will give you a hearing when your accusers arrive. And he commanded him to be guarded in Herod's praetorium. This is the word of our Lord. So... Our narrative this morning is divided into two sections. We have Paul's examination before the, the Sanhedrin, the council, and we have God's providential protection over Paul, moving him to Caesarea. Now before the Sanhedrin, Paul is able to utter only four short phrases before the council meeting dissolves into chaos. His first statement, this is as far as he gets before he's interrupted. He says in verse 1, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience to this day. And, and that's as far as he gets. Paul could address the Sanhedrin as brothers. He himself had once been a member of the Sanhedrin. Seventy men, um, religious leaders over the both cultural and religious and to a small extent governmental affairs of Jerusalem. Before Paul became a Christian, he was one of those 70. The Sanhedrin knew Paul. They knew the discipline and zeal with which Paul had pursued obedience to the law. Paul could write in all honesty about himself that, that he excelled everyone of his age in obedience to the law. That by righteousness according to the law, he was blameless. They knew his, his good conscience, his determination to strictly follow the law. They also knew that Paul had left them years ago, and that Paul was now preaching the faith that he had once tried to destroy. He was preaching the faith that they regarded as the worst form of blasphemy, to claim that this Jesus was God. But Paul insists that his conscience is clear, his, his conscience is good. When he was persecuting the church, his conscience was clear because he was convinced that he was doing the right thing and persecuting this way to death. And now, now that he's preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, his conscience is still clear because he's doing what he is convinced is right. He's obedient to the divine command. But we need to ask, how could Paul have a clear conscience about his past? He was a, in his own words, from 1 Corinthians. He was a blasphemer. I'm sorry, from 1 Timothy. He was a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent opponent of God. He was a murderer of the church. He'd say that he was the foremost of all sinners. But still he can say that I have lived before God in all good conscience. He could say that not because he had figured out some way to rationalize and excuse his past evil actions, but because God had cleansed his conscience. We'll, we'll often talk about having a clear conscience, but, but that can be misleading. We, we can think of Jiminy Cricket telling us to always let your conscience be your guide. 
But our conscience can be hardened and, and callous. It can excuse us for things that are genuinely wrong. We, we see it in the world all around us every day. Paul remarked himself, 1 Corinthians 4, 4, that, that just because I'm not aware of anything against myself, I am not thereby acquitted. I'm not my own judge. The Lord will judge me. So our conscience has to be informed by the Word of God, not by our society, not by our internal sense of right and wrong, not by our dreams, as, as Jude warned us against in what we read earlier. Our society and, and our internal moral compass are not strong enough or clear enough to guide us. But when the Holy Spirit brings conviction of sin, then our conscience is awakened to God's standard of righteousness. And then we realize, as Paul did, how wicked we are. Has, has God aroused your conscience? Do, do you recognize your sin and your need for forgiveness? If you don't, if you continue to view yourself as a basically good person, certainly not a wicked person, then you're cutting yourself off from the Word of God. You're cutting yourself off from your one hope of eternal life. You must accept your guilt so that you can be forgiven. Charles Spurgeon, British preacher in the 1800s, they put it very well. He said that those who know that they deserve to go to hell are not likely to end up there. Those who believe that they deserve to go to heaven will certainly never see that blessed place. If you think on your own merit that you deserve eternal life and joy and the blessings of God, then, then you are deceived. It's only when you recognize your sin before God and then call out for His forgiveness that you can be forgiven. Once we realize our guilt, once we realize how wickedly we behave towards our, our parents, towards our friends, towards our neighbors, and above all towards God, then we also realize that there's nothing we can do to wash away our sins. There's nothing that can cleanse our conscience. If I live the rest of my life in perfect obedience from this moment forward, it will not wash away the sins of my past. And I'm not capable of living in perfect obedience from this day forward. We can't purify ourselves. And so we, we cry out with Paul, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? We can't deliver ourselves. But the great promise of the gospel is that Jesus can. In Hebrews Chapter 9, verse 9, that the preacher remarks that the offerings of the Jewish sacrificial system cannot perfect the conscience of the worshipers. They, they cover over sins, but they don't purify the conscience. He, he remarks a few verses later, Hebrews 10, verses 1 and 2, that these sacrifices can never make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered? But in these sacrifices, there's a reminder of sin every year. He contrasts that with the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 9.14, he says, How much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? He says Hebrews 9.26 that, that Jesus has put away sin by the sacrifice of himself says Hebrews 10.14, By a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Christ has purified our conscience. Christ has put away our sin. Christ has perfected us for 
all time. Christian, you bear no more guilt. Christian, your conscience can be good because God has declared it so and made it so. We, we don't need to deny who we were. We, we don't need to deny how great our guilt was. But, but we can sing with Horatio Spafford, My sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part but the whole is nailed to the cross and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul. Your sin has been paid for. Your sin has been put away. You're covered in the righteousness of Christ. Micah chapter 7, we're told that the Lord has cast all our sin into the depths of the sea. It's gone. It's dealt with. Your conscience through Christ is good. It can be good. If you'll come to Him in repentance and faith. This claim to a good conscience is, is utterly intolerable to the world. The world recognizes guilt. They'll recognize guilt in others, at least, if, if not in themselves. And, and they've developed a system to try to deal with it. The Roman Catholic Church called it penance. You, you do these good works, these religious rituals, and, and that can make you right again. The, the secular humanists who run our society today, well, we'll call it activism, if they're being nice, or they'll call it wokeness or allyship, it's all the same thing. You're guilty. If not personally guilty, then, then you're guilty for benefiting from the systemic injustices in the world. And the only way you can be cleansed from your guilt is if you devote the rest of your life to doing what they tell you to do. And then you might be forgiven. Maybe. Maybe. But they can't tolerate a message of forgiveness. Uh, forgiveness that's not on the basis of, of penance or good works, but a forgiveness that's through the grace of God. They, they can't tolerate a conscience that's controlled by the word of God rather than by the thoughts of mankind. And so, as soon as Paul mentions his good conscience... Ananias, the high priest, is outraged and orders Paul struck on the mouth. How dare this man submit to any standard of righteousness other than the Sanhedrin's? And the spiritual descendants of Ananias are still striking on the mouth all those who refuse to submit to their standards today. Don't be surprised when they come for you. Be told that you're on the wrong side of history because they get to declare what the right side of history is, apparently. You'll, you'll be called a bigot. You'll be called foolish. You'll be called selfish. You'll be called evil. Because you dare to say that your conscience is good by the grace of God. Now Paul responds to being struck on the mouth. His, his response can be a little difficult to interpret because we, we can't hear his tone of voice and we can't ask him, Paul, what exactly were you trying to communicate in your response here? It's, it's very clear that Paul is not frightened or intimidated by the high priest or by the men who struck him. He responds with a pronouncement of judgment. He says, um, verse 3, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. He, he points out their sin, and they did sin. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law, and yet contrary to the law, you order me to be struck? And it was certainly a fair rebuke. Uh, Leviticus 19.15 demands that judgments be made fairly. 
You, you can't beat the defendant when he is defending himself before the judgment is made. Ananias was a notoriously sinful man. He was certainly sinning here. Ananias was a whitewashed wall, clothed in an outward veneer of cleanness, but inwardly filthy and dead. And Ananias was indeed struck down by God uh, in, in the year 66 AD, four years before the destruction of Jerusalem. Ananias is assassinated by Jews who hated his, his sinful wickedness and collusion with the Romans. Um, he's, he's assassinated. He is struck down by the hand of God. But as Paul issues this rebuke to Ananias, Paul himself is rebuked by those standing around him. Probably not the same people who struck him on the mouth. And they asked, verse 4, would you revile God's high priest? To, to revile means to, to insult or, or verbally abuse another, to, to slander. If, if I were standing in Paul's situation, then, then I'd certainly reply that I wasn't reviling the high priest. The high priest is, in fact, violating God's law, and he will, in fact, be judged for it. I'm not verbally abusing him. I'm telling him the truth. And I'd be kind of upset about it. But uh, Paul is a wiser and godlier man than I am. He, he doesn't defend himself against this charge of reviling God's high priest. He, he says, um, verse 5, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest, for it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. That's a citation from Exodus twenty-two twenty-eight. Um, again, if, if it were me, and I said those words, it would be a reply of pure snarkiness. How was I supposed to know he's a high priest? He's not acting like a high priest. Shouldn't the high priest know the law and follow the law? But we should understand that Paul is, is being sincere here. He, he really didn't know that he was a high priest. Um, because however Paul might feel... God's word is clear. You're, you're not to speak evil of a ruler of the people. And as, as evil as Ananias was, you, you can't revile God's high priest. You can correct him, but not revile him. So, there's a lot of reasons why Paul might not know that this was the high priest. Um, it's very possible that Paul suffered from poor eyesight ever since he was blinded on the road to Damascus. Um, he, he mentions to the Galatians that, that when he was with them, they, they would have been willing to pluck out their own eyes and give that to him. It's possible that, that Paul suffered from vision problems through the rest of his life. Uh, it, it's possible that the high priest wasn't wearing his high priestly garments. This was a hastily assembled informal gathering of the Sanhedrin. He might have just been dressed as, as all the other Jews and, and not wearing his turban and his breastplate and everything that marked him as the high priest. It's very possible, you know, Paul was gazing at the Sanhedrin, again, it was 70 people um, sitting in probably a semicircle, so he can't see everybody at once. He, he's, maybe he's gazing intently this way, and Ananias from over there orders him to be struck. And he knows somebody did it, but he doesn't know who. Uh, we, we don't know why Paul didn't know Ananias was a high priest. Um, but we have to believe that Paul was being sincere and honest when he said he didn't know he was a high priest. We do know that Paul was not intimidated by these cultural elites sitting in judgment on him. And we also know that Paul was under submission to God's laws, not, not culture's. If Scripture says you shall not speak evil of a ruler of the people, then Paul's going to apologize for speaking evil of a ruler of the people, and he won't do it, no matter how he might feel. God's law is our law. May we strive to do likewise, always speaking to speak, always seeking to speak the truth in love, without reviling without resorting to insults and verbal abuse. And when we do sin by speaking evil against another, may we quickly repent and acknowledge our guilt.
So those are the first three statements that Paul made. And all really short, I've lived before God in all good conscience to this day. Then after he struck, God is going to strike you. And, and then, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest. For it is written in the law, you shall not speak evil. Ruler of the people. Then he, he makes one last statement, and, and then everything just falls apart. Um, it's his last statement, not because he's done talking, but because it provokes just as much of a reaction as his earlier statement before the crowd that he had been sent to the Gentiles. We see this last statement in verse 6. Now, when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the others Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. Again, it can be tempting to see this as a cynical ploy by Paul, just an effort to derail the proceedings by giving these two different factions within the Sanhedrin something to argue about, but... I'm convinced that's not what Paul's doing. Um, he's not really intimidated about being before the Sanhedrin. He's not worried about what their judgment's going to be. Paul sees an opportunity to make a statement that is completely true and a statement that will appeal to the Pharisees to see that his faith is not a perversion of their belief, but the perfection of their beliefs. He says that he is a Pharisee. Not, I was a Pharisee. Not, I was trained as a Pharisee. He says, brothers, I am a Pharisee. Luke helpfully points out that, that while the Sadducees are functionally equivalent to, to liberal Christianity today, they, they deny the resurrection, they deny all the supernatural elements of, of God's word, that the Pharisees acknowledge them all. They acknowledge the resurrection. They acknowledge angels and spirits. They, they would be more like the evangelicals or, or even fundamentalists of the Jewish world. We, we, so often, we see Jesus rebuking the Pharisees so often in Scripture because they, they were wrong. But the Pharisees were a whole lot closer to the truth of Christianity than the Sadducees. Jesus didn't even bother with the Sadducees because they were so far gone from the truth. There were Pharisees who became Christians while remaining Pharisees. And, and they were truly converted and faithful Christians. No Sadducee could do that without completely repudiating everything that they had believed. And so Paul's saying to the Pharisees, I haven't left the Pharisee party. I've just learned the truth, the fulfillment of all the promises that we believe in. You believe in the resurrection of the dead. I'm here because of my hope in the resurrection of the dead. The resurrection of Jesus Christ. He's saying that if you believe in the entire word of God like the Pharisees did, then you should accept the hope and the resurrection of the dead that centers the Christian faith. This, the resurrection of the dead is, is central to absolutely everything in our faith. A, Christ, a, a, well, a Christless Christianity, a resurrectionless Christianity, is, is no Christianity at all. It's, it's just a list of moral orders to follow. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 2, lists the resurrection of the dead as one of the elementary doctrines of the church, one of the foundational truths of the Christian faith. One of the things you, you have to understand to be a Christian and it is one of those elementary doctrines because death is one of the fundamental problems of human existence. It was brought about by Adam and Eve's disobedience in the Garden of Eden. In the day that you eat of it, dying you shall die. But they took and they ate. God declared to Adam that dust you were and to dust you shall return. 
But even as the curse was being pronounced upon humanity, God began to work to save a people from its power. It was with the help of the Lord that Eve bore children. And it was from among those children that God preserved and purified and protected a people from Seth through Noah to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to, to Joseph and Moses and Joshua to Samuel and David and, and Solomon to Ezra and Nehemiah and Esther and Ruth. God created and protected and preserved a people, ultimately leading to the birth of the promised one, Jesus Christ. Throughout the history of that people, the Jews, God had made promise after promise through his prophets that God would deal with their sin. And through dealing with their sin, God would deal with death. Promise was made so incredibly clear through the prophet Isaiah. Isaiah uh, chapter 26. Isaiah would write, Because the Lord said, Your dead shall live, their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy. For your dew is a dew of light, and the earth will give birth to the dead. Daniel would declare the same thing in, in Daniel chapter 12. That both the righteous and the wicked would rise from the dead to appear before the Lord. And it was this hope that the dead shall live that motivated everything in Paul's life. It's why he could write in, in Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 11. He'd say that, I've suffered the loss of all things, and I count all these things as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in Him. Not having a righteousness of my own that comes through the law, but the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know Him and the power of His resurrection, and may share in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. By any means possible that I may attain the resurrection from the dead. It's, it's why he would write to the Corinthian church, 1 Corinthians 15, that if there is no resurrection from the dead, if Christ is not raised then we have life in this world only. For we have hope for this life only. And if we have hope for this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. We're pathetic fools with absolutely nothing if there is no resurrection from the dead. But Paul insists that in fact Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. Time fails us to say everything that could be said about the resurrection of the dead. It, it's clearly promised in Isaiah 26. It's clearly promised in Daniel 12. It's clearly promised in Revelation chapter 20. It's given the most detail in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. To, to summarize, the scripture teaches us that there will be a bodily resurrection of the dead. Our souls will be reunited with our bodies so that we might stand bodily before the judgment seat of God. Revelation 20 tells us that, that those whose names are not found written in the Lamb's book of life will be cast into bodily cast into the lake of fire, the second death. Hell and death itself are going to be cast into the lake of fire with the devil and his angels. But those whose names are in the book of life will spend eternity in the new heaven and the new earth, in the holy city, the new Jerusalem, in the presence of God with glorified, imperishable, powerful, sinless, spiritual 
physical bodies bearing the image of Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians 15.54 says that at that point, Then shall come to pass what is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Scripture teaches us that everyone will be raised. But not everyone should have hope in that resurrection. Because the wicked will be raised unto death. So they can be swallowed up with death. But the just will be raised up to victory and life in Jesus Christ. And it's the resurrection of Jesus Christ that gives us our confidence in our resurrection unto life. Paul would write in Romans chapter 6, verses 4 and 5, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with Him in a death like His, we shall certainly be united with Him in a resurrection like His. So the bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ is a promise for all those united with Him in faith that they will also be bodily resurrected to eternal life. Do you believe in the resurrection of the dead? Do you know that you have eternal life? There's a, there's a phrase, there's actually two phrases to describe the same thing. One seems needlessly overcomplicated. The other seems incredibly oversimplified. I, I haven't thought of a phrase that I think gets it quite right yet. Um, if, you, if you want to be really technical, you can call it realized eschatology. Uh, if you want to be simplistic, uh, you can call it the already, not yet, of the Christian life. They're, they're both describing the same thing. Again, Romans 6, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the power of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. There's this already, not yet component to the resurrection. We sang, we are raised with him. Baptism represents that, that we have died to our sins and we now live in Christ. The life I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. I haven't received my resurrected body yet, but, but I have received a, a resurrected soul set free from the power, or not that I've received, I am a resurrected soul set free from the power of sin, able to, able, able to walk in obedience to the Word of God and to know the joy of God that surpasses understanding. We're, we're already experiencing the first fruits of the resurrection through our union with Christ. And how much greater will it be in that great day? The resurrection of the dead. We've received the Holy Spirit, who's the guarantee of our salvation until it appears. Do you know that you have eternal life? Come back to that question in, in just a few moments. Um, we'll look at the rest of the chapter in much faster fashion. Uh, it's, it's all narrative. As soon as Paul says, it is because of the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I'm on trial today, the proceedings just disintegrate. There's a great strife between the Pharisees and the Sanhedrin. The Pharisees believe in the resurrection of the dead. They need to defend this man on the resurrection of the dead. They say, we find no fault in this man. What if an angel spoke to him? They're not, they're not ready to say, yes, he's right, and Jesus Christ is the hope of the resurrection of the dead. But they're not ready to dismiss it out of hand either. Say, okay, he, maybe he's right. Instead of condemning him, let's consider what he's saying in light of God's word. The Sadducees are, are just, no, this man needs to die. 
She's disrupting things. So there's this great fight. The, the Romans drag Paul back to the barracks. They're afraid he's going to be torn apart. The Sadducees and the Pharisees are so angry at each other. And, and as Paul is, is back in the Roman barracks, the Lord appears to him, verse 11, and tells him, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. You talking about, Paul, this isn't the end. I have more work for you to do. Just as you've, you've told the truth here in Jerusalem, I'm going to bring you to Rome, and you'll speak for me there as well. And, and we see God's providence in, in bringing that to pass. Just as we've seen God's providence again and again in these last several chapters. There, there are more than 40 Jews, supporters of the Sadducees, doubtful that any of them are members of the Sanhedrin, but people supporting the Sadducees, who make a plot and a pledge to assassinate Paul. This man's turning the world upside down. We can't have that. We're not going to eat or drink until Paul is dead. And they go to the chief priests and the elders. They go to Ananias. Say, Ananias, I know you have a problem with this Paul guy. We'll take care of him for you. All you need to do is ask the tribune to, to bring him back to the Sanhedrin tomorrow so you can, in a more dignified and careful way, examine him more closely. And he won't ever get there. We'll, we'll intercept him on the way. We'll kill him. And, and these... The, the history of, of the Jewish people shows that there were plenty of Jews more than willing to die to accomplish their purposes. They, they'd have no problem if all 40 of them died after assassinating Paul. They were going to get to him. They were going to assassinate him and, and let the Romans do what they would. So they have this plot. They have a plan. And Paul's saved because his nephew, the son of his sister, hears about it. And if, if Luke were writing a novel, at this point the editor would send back the manuscript with a note saying, Come on, Luke. You can't just introduce this random nephew that no one's ever heard of who just happens to be in the right place to save the day. Come on, be realistic. If we're reading this as a secular history, then, then we'd just have to say... Man, that's a rather crazy coincidence. What a happy accident for Paul. But there are no accidents. There's only providence. Saul was born in Tarsus, hundreds of miles away from Jerusalem. But somehow his sister's son is in Jerusalem. Maybe the entire family moved to Jerusalem. Maybe his nephew is there to study under the Pharisees. Maybe he's there to study under the Sadducees. We, we don't know. But he's there. The plot was made in secret, but Paul's nephew was in position to hear it. Again, maybe, maybe he was serving one of the elders or the chief priests when it was told to them. Maybe he just happened to be walking down the street and he overheard... The whispers, we, we don't know, but he was in a position to hear it. Paul had alienated his family by becoming a Christian. Certainly when he says, I have suffered the loss of all things, he's referring both to the loss of his position in the Sanhedrin in the Jewish community and his family. But... Paul's nephew decides that he's going to take a risk to save Paul's life. Maybe he too had become a Christian. Maybe he was a member of the Pharisees' party and, and just thought that it was more important to protect Paul to deny the, Pharise the Sadducees this, this victory. Maybe he just decided that family was more important than his theology. We, we don't know any of these things. We don't even know the name of Paul's nephew. But we know that through the providential circumstances of Paul's life and Paul's nephew, that Paul was protected from this plot and brought safely to Caesarea. The tribune listened to this random Jew and ordered a large force, a large portion of his forces, together to get Paul out of Jerusalem. They, they marched to Antipatris 
Um, and then the horsemen take him the rest of the way to, to Caesarea. There'd be no opportunity for the Jews to assassinate Paul. Not while he's in Caesarea. And it's moving Paul a step closer to getting to Rome. The, the tribune couldn't send Paul to Rome, but the governor at Caesarea could. In, in all these things, God wisely and powerfully governs all of his creatures and all of their actions for the good of his elect and for his glory. And I'm asking you now to consider God's providence in your life and how he's brought you to this place today. There, there's, there's one person here who's really from Belleville. Um, another one who's born about 60 miles north of Belleville. Um, and, and, I mean, the rest, we're, we're from all over the place. We're, we're from different continents. Although Manny will insist that Panama is a part of North America. Technically, he's right. Central America. Um, Yet, yet here we are. None of us deliberately set a course for our lives that would end up with us in Belleville. None of us thought as, as children, man, I really hope that I can move into Belleville when I grow up. But, but here we are. Through, through marriages, through education, through, through adoption, through employment, through, through the military or, or the government. Um, you just... Through friendships, we've, we've all these things have worked together to bring us here today. And it's not an accident. It's, it's providence. God has brought you here that, that you might hear and answer the question, do you know that you have eternal life? Do you know the hope of the resurrection of the dead? God has set before you this hope through the gospel of His Son. Jesus commands you to die to yourself, to repent of your sins, and to trust in His sacrifice upon the cross. The Holy Spirit speaks through His Word today, showing you your sins, showing you the path of life that God has set before you. This eternal life is freely given to all who believe. Will you receive it or will you reject it? Will this be the day you remember as you stand before Christ? That great day of joy when the fount of every blessing finally tuned your heart to sing His praise and His grace? Or will it be the day that Christ points out to you, saying, I set eternity before you, and you rejected it. I set righteousness before you, and you rejected it. I set myself before you, you rejected me. Life or death, joy or suffering is set before you today. God has brought you here that you might hear this gospel. Will you trust in Him? You can know the hope of the resurrection of the dead. And once you've trusted Him, as you continue trusting Him, then, then I urge you to live every moment of every day of the rest of your lives 
in light of this hope of the resurrection from the dead. At the end of, of 1 Corinthians 15, that great exposition about the resurrection, I should all read it quickly. Uh, Paul ends the chapter, verse 58, saying, Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. It's because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's because of our future bodily resurrection that we can remain steadfast in all the trials of life. That we can abound in the work of the Lord in every circumstance. That we can be absolutely certain that no matter how despised we are by the world, no matter how pitiful our work seems, even to our own eyes, that our work is not in vain. Resurrection Day is coming. Live in light of eternity. Live and die for the hope of the resurrection of the dead. Will you pray with me? God, we, we bless you. You are our creator, our sustainer, our teacher, the author and perfecter of our faith. Thank you even for the created world which reveals your glory. And we thank you much more for the pages of revelation that you have spread before us. That in them we can see what you would have us to do, what you have required of us, and above all, what you have done for us and promised to us and given us in your Son. Lord, we ask that you would give us, give us this hope. Lord, give us a, conscience, a conscious experience of your salvation in the deliverance of our, from our sins, in, in our bearing of his image, in enjoying his holy presence, in being upheld by the Holy Spirit. Lord, let us not live uncertain of what we are or where we are going. Bear witness with our spirit that we are your children. Allow each one of us to say, I know my Redeemer and I know that I have eternal life. Lord, bless us with an ever-growing sense of this salvation. If we are already enlightened in Christ, let us see greater things. If we are alive in Christ, let us have more life. If we are renewed in Christ, let us go on from strength to strength. If we abide in Christ, let us abide closer to Him, that we can bring forth more fruit, that we can surrender all of our being to Him, that we may have a fuller joy and may serve Him more completely. May we have a faith working out in love. And Lord, for those who know nothing of your salvation, Lord, we ask that you would make them alive for the very first time today, that they would see and know that the years of their lives prior to this day are years of death and sin and shame, but that they might have consciences purified by the death of your Son. Save them, Lord, we pray. Save us, Lord, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.